All right. I'm, I just have a very few brief comments. Uh, maybe um, if you want to wait before you go out to talk to the speakers or so. Um, so, yeah, so this will be very short. Uh, but what I just wanted to say is, first off, that this has been... Um, Okay, so this speaker series has been incredible. It's been an international collaboration from scientists, from um, people from different cultures, from politicians, from political activism, just an enormous range, and it's been tremendously successful. So I want to also um, thank all of you who came for that, but also um, think about going forward as we try to bring out from what we've heard here into the culture. I want to just raise a few of the controversial topics or the challenging topics that we need to think about um, as we move forward. And so the first one for me in our particular th um, context is that we want to help people as quickly as possible. There's so much suffering. There's so much that we could do with psychedelics. and it's been a challenge to raise the money all through donations. And so because the political situation has been changed and that there's kind of an open door through the regulatory systems now, and there's a lot of positive support in the media, we've been approached quite a lot by investors. So I personally have been saying no to investors. I think it's really important that we take um, MDMA through for PTSD, through FDA in Europe, through donations rather than investors. but. On the other hand, there are people that are um, suffering, and perhaps if we had investor money, we could um, make things happen quicker. On the other hand, you get all these perverse incentives when you get investors who want to corral things and create patents and make it more difficult. So I, I personally um, support the work of Compass, which is the for-profit company <clears throat> trying to make psilocybin into a medicine. But I think we need USONA as the nonprofit to sort of keep the for-profit in check. So I think how we move forward with investors is, is a big issue. Um, right now, we're basically saying no to them, at least at the MAPS level. Um, also, what do we think about as we broaden our support, what about controversial donors? Um, for us, I've uh, addressed that. Um, you know, we, we've gotten money from Rebecca Mercer, whose family owned Cambridge Analytica. We've gotten money from the, um, the Koch family who've been supportive of what we're doing, and, and also from George Soros, who's controversial on his old, own, you know, from a lot of people criticizing him for being on the left wing. So um, the general approach, I think we'll have more and more um, people who are interested in participating, and how do we handle that? And my approach um, so far, just to say this, is that I think if people are interested in collaborating with us on uh, doing the research, but don't have strings attached with what they want us to do or what they want us to say or what they don't want us to say, then I think it's appropriate. And I think some of the um, opportunity, some of the um, donors have been um, concerned about um, this whole intersection between science and politics. And so, you know, I've been encouraged. Um, in some places to stop talking about uh, the, the long-term goals being beyond medicine, beyond uh, religion into drug uh, legalization and licensed legalization. So those kind of um, strings I've also rejected. So I think if we can get money from wherever it is, um, and if we can do good with it, that's my approach. But I think that's something really to, to think about. Um, what about working with repressive governments? Um, We've been approached by one of our donors who's very interested in having us bring MDMA to China. Um, I've been to China, um, so has Amy Emerson, the leader of our benefit corporation. We went with the Israeli um, principal investigator who was the chief scientist, uh, chief psychiatrist for the Israeli Defense Forces, and we're bringing now uh, eight to ten therapists from China to our training from uh, in October. So China is a repressive government. They're very much um, authoritarian, and so how do we think about bringing uh, MDMA therapy to these uh, countries? Um, my approach on that has been to think about um, how could it be misused? In what ways um, could MDMA be misused for mind control? Could it be used for interrogations, things like that? And, and if so, those are already out there. That those you know militaries of the world know all about that, but. 
Um, you know, the biggest danger that I see, um, I wouldn't say danger, but just the fact that China appropriates all intellectual property. And so, so what? If we start research in China and they take it away and nothing ever comes back to maps, it just seems to me that the more people in China that are not motivated by trauma, the better off. So that's just, you know, one thought. But again, that's something that we're keeping in mind. How do you, um, you know, think about which kind of countries? Right now, Russia is all shut down for psychedelic research because they're so authoritarian. But um, you know, maybe that would change and we would have opportunities in Russia. So should we go forward with that or not? Um, what about working with the Department of Defense? I mean, we've been trying for such a long time to get the Veterans Administration involved with psychedelics and it looks like uh, Rachel Yehuda, who spoke here yesterday, um, is on the verge of getting approval in the Bronx VA to do MDMA research that we would fund um, inside the VA system with veterans. But in general, I think we should be moving towards treating people closer to the trauma, not let it, and this means both um, moving more towards adolescents and young people who are traumatized, not just right now we can only work with 18 year olds or above with no upper limit, but eventually we wanna be moving towards um, adolescents and even um, potentially younger people who are traumatized. So what about working with active duty soldiers who end up potentially being healed from trauma and going back into the battle. Uh, you know, is that immoral? Is that unethical? Or is that um, something healing? And, and that doesn't apply just to psychedelics. Every new medical technology is used by the military. So are we against all new medical advances? Are we against the military? And I think there needs to be a distinction between the people in the military and the politicians that allocate and prioritize what the military is going to do. So I think, um, you know, one of the statements says, you know, love the soldier, hate the war. I think we need to really be willing, and in our view, we are willing to move deeper and deeper into the military system, actually try to heal people from their PTSD shortly after they're traumatized. And I think that chances are people will be more humane in what they do. And I also believe that if it weren't for the military, um, particularly in the past in World War II, you know, my Jewish family would have been wiped out if the Nazis would have taken over the world. So I think that, or even if the Russians would have taken over the world, or even if Trump uh, allies with the Russians and creates authoritarian, you know, we need to be wary and we need, uh, it's still a militaristic world. And so I think there's uh, something very honorable of uh, people who are willing to put aside their personal interests in their lives to fight for the collective. So at least I've answered that question that I think it's fine for us to work with um, active duty soldiers even if they return to, to duty. Um, and we should be, again, focusing politically on what they're asked to do rather than helping them heal from their trauma. But that's uh, a fairly controversial issue as well. Um, I think in terms of the dangers, and, and I think as we go out and talk into the world about um, what, we, what you've learned here and all, one of the biggest dangers is overstating the benefits and understating the risks. So I'll just say, David, when you talked about the Good Friday experiment, um, one person did have a bummer of an experience um, and he was tranquilized by uh, Timothy Leary and Houston Smith given Thorazine and they never talked about it at all. And when I called him for the follow-up, um, he said if I ever talked to him or called him again, he would sue me. So, but he was uh, married, had a family, and was a minister. So his life hadn't gone downhill, but he'd had a very difficult experience during the Good Friday experiment. So that's just one example of how we need to be very, very careful not to overstate the benefits, because then we'll be attacked for that, or understate the risks. And so if we can do that, I think we're really going to build trust in society, build trust with the media, and we'll be able to, um, to move forward. Um, I think the other more important thing or even is who do we think we are? Um, are we counterculture? Is this Burning Man rebels? Or are we actually part of a larger culture that we want to then expand the larger culture into opening to psychedelics, opening to these kind of religious spiritual experiences? And so I think that's a, a big issue for each of us to address. And I've sort of grown up, I think, in a very... Um, 
I would say, mainstream family that was very interested in um, blending in and, and that I grew up wanting that. And so I don't really want to be a counterculture drug-using criminal. I want to be a uh, legal mainstream drug user. <laughs> and so I think if we can um, just each of us ask for ourselves, wh where are we going? Are we going towards, you know, we're rebels to undermine society or we're trying to go into the heart of the system and, and embed us. And I'd say one of the best examples for that, and I, I want to really thank uh, David and Mia and others, is this idea of the catharsis on the mall. So for those of you that don't know, we brought Burning Man to the Washington, D.C. mall. So the, the, you know, the sacred space of Burning Man, in a way, is between uh, center camp and the man and the temple. And if you think about the sacred space of America, it's the National Mall with the Washington Monument and the Capitol. And so it was a big mission of ours to try to work together with the DC burner community to bring uh, Burning Man and have all night dance parties till sunrise on the Washington Mall. And of course, you can't just have a party on the mall. You have to protest. So it was catharsis for healing, for trauma. Um, but it's that kind of coming together of our worlds that we really need to see more of. And it's free. That's great. It's, that, yeah, it's completely free. It might even be the, one of the only free Burning Man uh, regionals. Um, another big challenge for us is how to keep the media positive. So we've been incredibly fortunate over the last 10, 15 years to have virtually no negative stories. And even now, people that are... Um, uh, taking psilocybin or taking LSD and then committing violent acts, even murdering people, um, which are some horror stories that are actually happening, or people dying at raves, that's still happening, but it's not blown up by the media as all that's happening because we have the research and the science, which is sort of the dominant story. So how do we keep that going? And I think one of the main reasons uh, that we can keep that going is to bring patients forward and have them tell their stories. Uh, because people will respond to that. So that's going to be another challenge. Um, we've added a new woman to the board of directors of MAPS. She's um, led two of the largest nonprofit pharmaceutical companies, uh, One World Health and Medicines 360, Drugs for Africa, Drugs Low Cost Pharmaceuticals. She's got over probably $200 million in donations from Gates and Buffett. Um, and she wants to help us make ayahuasca into a medicine. And she's also interested in working with us on Ibogaine. So what are these issues of cultural appropriation? How do we take something from a culture that has used it for a long time, is still using it, but then um, take it and transform it and use it in a different cultural context? Is that appropriate? Um, or, and how do we, and I personally think that it is. I think these drugs and the, are tools. They're owned by humanity, you could say, not just particular people that discovered them, but how do we move forward to take tools that are primarily used in religious context and take them into more Western scientific therapeutic context and honor where they came from, but at the same time change them to make them culturally appropriate. So I think that's gonna be a big issue as we move forward with ayahuasca and I began. Um, and then one of our issues uh, is going to be for us, it's also going to be for USONA and Compass, it's going to be this whole question of uh, post approval pricing. So the real question is what does it mean to have a MAPS public benefit corp? How do you define the public benefit? And how do you operationalize that? And so when you go to the B Corp people, they have uh, criteria for B Corps but none of them apply to the pharmaceutical industry. So we've had to make up our own, and so we're trying to evaluate ourselves. But the real issues will come, where do we set the price of MDMA? How do we set the price for the training? How do we really um, provide equitable access? How do we train enough African-American therapists? How do, how, so there's a lot of different ways that we're gonna try to focus on the public benefit but I think that's going to be the real challenge because we're trying to create a whole different model for pharmaceutical drug development that doesn't end up with profit maximization, but it ends up with social benefit. But how do we actually do that? And I think that's going to be our, our main challenge going forward to operationalize that. Um, and I think that the, there's other controversial issues. I, I'd be interested if anybody um, wants to raise any other controversial <laughs> issues that we haven't thought about, challenges as we go forward, or things that we should be thinking about, because you've got uh, David and Mia and myself and others that are here. So 
If you have other issues, topics that we should keep in mind, um, I'd appreciate hearing about them. Has a microphone. So one thing that I, it's not necessarily a controversial issue, but as I've gone through different um, fields of advocacy, whether it was environmentalism or agriculture, uh, or the recent formation of the High Sierra Psychedelic Society in the Reno Tahoe area, um, I was a corporate banker in my 18 to 25 years, and I love psychology. And what I see is that we have a population of people that's a relatively small population that essentially make the world go round. And when I was talking to Tim Chang a few months ago, I asked him, you know, are we intentionally targeting the 1% um, and trying to cultivate experiences that are psychedelic if we know this creates empathy? And if we know this population is essentially what's creating the demise of the rest of the world. Uh, and he said that fortunately for things like Burning Man that some of that is happening and there is some intentional cultivation. But is there any thoughts more of like, you know, really targeting a population and having a, a top-down effect? Um, well, I, I think first off that there are those efforts going in all sorts of different ways. There's actually um, some of the people that um, I can't talk too much about, but that worked in Washington, D.C., that have, there's ayahuasca circles outside of D.C., and there's been, uh, you know, Senate aides, House aides, some members of Congress going to have these kind of experiences, which unfortunately they can't really talk about it in a public way. So I think there are those efforts, you know, very intensively and intentionally going on. But at the same time, we need to really keep in mind that it's got to be directed towards mass mental health but that the change makers at the top often do determine what shows up in the media. So for example, with Rebecca Mercer, it's not that she's had these psychedelic experiences, but she was very supportive of helping veterans. And because of that, we've got positive coverage on Fox News and Breitbart and all these other ways. So the idea of influencers having a big impact is really right. Um, but again, it has to be done in a very delicate way. So yeah, that, that's happening. Thank you, Rick. That was an incredible download and update. <laughs> that was awesome. And um, I loved also hearing about the cultural context and bringing some of these medicines like ayahuasca and ibogaine synthesized into our own culture. And as someone who has deep relationships with indigenous elders in the Bwiti tradition in Africa, they want to simply be in the conversation. And I'm not sure if, if you're aware of some of the scientific research on the music and what it does to the brain and some of their elements of ceremony, like how it regulates the heart. To be in a respectful council, you know, to be listening and in dialogue. And I would love to see more uh, bridges of communication between the scientific world and the indigenous teachers of just openness and uh, sharing, because they, they're not here to impose any ideas. And they even say that their, their tradition is not a religion, but a study of life that is infinite. And they want to they wanna join the party. And <laughs> I'd, love to, I'd love to see more, more councils like that. Thank you. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, in the same vein, though, I'm really grateful many, many times that MDMA does not have a cultural history or that it's synthetic from the lab so that we can then create it fresh without, you know, trying to, you know, have people think that we're, you know, stepping on their toes or ignoring what they do. But I think going back to the uh, people that have used this for thousands of years. The, the one thing I will say is that, again, there's power dynamics, so that these are not always the ideal models. The shaman is the powerful man. You've heard um, Tom and Sri talk about how this is about helping people heal themselves, and so there is a different power differential. So there's things that, that I think the indigenous could learn from us. There's stuff we can learn from them, and I think that kind of dialogue is, is really important. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Hi, I'm Danielle. Um, so my question is, I, I, I'll just say, segue. I live in, uh, I thought I lived in progressive New England until I came to Burning Man and I realized that the Northeast was actually a little bit uptight about things. And um, I'm a bridger. Um, I also live in North Carolina. 
Um, my mom has recently been appointed to the governor's table of mental health people and has a consortium for mental health excellency around the world. And also going back to Massachusetts, I also live there in the heart of opioid epidemic. I can point around the, my community and I don't know, a family that's been affected by a loved one who's passed away. And what I find is in the New England communities, the AA is really strong because it's a proving ground. And what I find in other regions is that generationally speaking, my generation perhaps is more prone to the dead show and the mushrooms and the marijuana, whereas the elder generation is, understands more a drink in the evening or tobacco use. And so my question in general, and for, for me as I advance, is how, how do I, and what sort of information other than, hey, look at, look at me, I, you know, I learned how to hula hoop or whatever, like, how, how do I bridge this communication to people that are so afraid, like, to accept the new paradigm? I mean, even my own mother, you know, because I see, this is personal, so keep it personal, but I see her with her health issues and I see how they're emotionally connected. And I'm like, mom, you need to drink some ayahuasca. And she's like, that would kill me right now. You know, and, and, and other persons. I, I need, because I can be like, watch this documentary on Netflix, you know, but that doesn't mean they're going to. Yeah, it's a, it's a crucial question is how do we reach out to people that are more fearful of what we're talking about? And we are, are each the, our best messenger. So for your mother, for example, that if she sees you changing in a positive way, then she'll be more likely to listen to you. Um, one thing I've done with my grandmother who was depressed um, and I could never get permission to give her MDMA which my parents said was a requirement, but I took MDMA and spent the day with her. And we learned a lot about each other. And so I think that you could do something like that. You know, you could be with people who are scared to take it, but you could take it yourself and spend the day with them so that they can see what it does to you. But they'll really be looking at your progress. So we have a senior DEA official who's a consultant to us because his son went into the military, has PTSD, and uses cannabis for PTSD. So the father saw the son helped by cannabis and then it changed his mind completely about the medical use of cannabis for PTSD and now he's helping us with MDMA. So I, th I think that there needs to be um, sort of um, a more open kind of dialogue with people that are really scared of what we're doing and try to listen to them as much as we can and then, then slowly respond and don't think that change will happen very quickly, but, um, but I think that, that it's, it's really, we're the messenger and we're the message, how we've changed. And that's what your family members and others will look at. I will say about your mother in North Carolina that our, one of our main training centers is now gonna be Asheville, North Carolina. So if she wants to be, what? Okay, well, well, we can talk about more, but that, that's the story for your, for your mother. I'd like to sort of maybe, she would be interested in talking to some of our um, MDMA PTSD lead therapists who are in North Carolina. Oh, I can't hear you, David. So in a very similar way, my mom is not a psychonaut and I'm a somewhat questionable messenger and, you know, so uh, but when we had Richard Rockefeller, uh, Dr. Richard Rockefeller come and really just break down MDMA therapy and just how, you know, just from his expert medical perspective. So I think definitely um, that idea of introducing, uh, you know, just having the right spokespeople, definitely the medical professionals like Steve Ross and, and, uh, and Michael Mitover and in North Carolina, like, obviously that's the most effective. Um, along with, my mom's like psyched by my example, I guess, but a little scared by it. <laughs> so um, my, my mom actually has already founded uh, a mental health healing farm in, in Nashville. We've been there for over 20 years. Uh, 
Yeah, I was hoping we could. Okay, just a couple more at 6.30. We gotta go eat and then go out to the burn. First of all, thank you so much for the speaker series. It's, it's incredible and we need a bigger dome, obviously. Well, I don't deserve hardly any credit, really. It's David, Neo, Andy, it's others. Well, 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 thank you to you all. And Rick, as you know, I usually look at these things from uh, the money and what money is uh, going to be fighting against. I think anyone is um, naive if they're not looking at things from that point of view as well as others. I think MAPS has done a brilliant job at anticipating problems down the road and has right side step. But my question involves holotropic breath work. It is incredibly powerful, and I know it's important to look at all of these other psychedelics, but I don't hear much about holotropic breath work being, uh, um, uh, uh, I'll say, just pushed uh, uh, or, or presented in, in, in any way, um, the way that uh, psilocybin and MDMA, it, it's, I don't know, could you just speak a little bit to that? Thank you. Yeah, yeah so, you know, we, we did have holotropic breathwork sessions here from uh, Shilo. Um, but I, I think that there's, um, first off, there's complications in that Stan Groff has sold the rights to holotropic breathwork to other people who are training it. He no longer even has the trademark. He can't even use the word holotropic breathwork. He has sold that to the, uh, the people that are trying to develop holotropic breathwork. So Stan has talked about trying to do something new with a new name and things like that, but, but whole drop of breathwork is actually incredible and, and you can go very, very deep. And what it basically shows is that the experiences that you have are not, when you take LSD, are not like LSD experiences, but they're human experiences because you can get there with just breathing and meditation and other ways. So th th it's incredibly powerful um, and many of the, underground psychedelic therapists use holotropic breath work to first before they do work with psychedelics and there are workshops all over the place. Um, I think th that my main answer to you is that if I had a choice between holotropic breath work and psychedelics, I'd take psychedelics and therefore what I, you know, because our time is limited and because we have to really be focused, you know, we're not MAPS. I mean, I'm, I'm trained in holotropic breath work. Most of our, Michael Midhofer is trained in breath work. A lot of our key therapists are trained in the breath work. But it's something that doesn't have any natural legal obstacles. It's legal and it can grow, but the psychedelics are what's blocked. And so that's where we're just focusing on that. But I think you're right to call attention to breath work and that hopefully it will grow um, further, but it's not clear exactly how Stan's going to extricate uh, and start a new line of tra training and training people. And so it's limited by those people that have the trademark and they are only a family operation growing only at a certain size and they're not really scaling up in the way that they could, but Stan doesn't have much he can do about it. So yeah, it's, it's problematic. Um, I think that'll probably be the last question. Hey Rick, uh, so I'm a, I'm a marketing person who really hates marketing and uh, my question is still about communication but on a much broader scale. Uh, so you know you guys have been doing your TED Talks, you made that documentary which was amazing, uh, you're doing this which is also amazing, it's working really well. I mean what channels, like so for example, if someone who is advocating for some political candidate, you know, comes up to me, I'm walking, I'm minding my own business, and they come up to me and be like, hey, you want to learn about psychedelics? You know, the natural response to most people, for most people is going to be, you know, like, fuck you, hippie, something like that. It's like, but, I mean, what marketing channels right. actually work on a, bro okay. on a broad scale, yeah. like for the layman's, you know, right. well, perspective? Well, what happened a few hours ago, uh, TV, so Dr. Oz came by. And he's got an incredible audience. You know, he's worked with Oprah a lot, and you know, he's got some credibility issues about some of the things that he's endorsed. But he came by, and he's interested in doing a show on psychedelics, and was <laughs> wondering if we would participate. So, 
uh, yeah, I think that's generally going to be a good thing. We have to be careful about, again, not overstating the benefits, not understanding risks, and we're in a channel where, you know, sometimes that seems to have happened. But I think uh, I, I took a class with the guy that introduced the idea of designated driver into America and around the world. And he talked about how he did it. This was at the Harvard School of Public Health. And he did it through TV shows and movies and public service announcements. So the best marketing is where it's sort of subliminal. It's part of the story. It's not like a particular ad that somebody has purchased. So I think one of our efforts is trying to get more psychedelic storylines in TV and movies. Um, maybe even we can get some public service announcements. Um, but it's again, it's this question that, that sort of David was alluding to, you know, it's like who's the right messenger for the right, um, the message. And so what we found and what Graham and the surveys have found is that it's the patients who've been healed are the best messengers. Not the people that are saying, we want to make this into a medicine or we want to change the laws, but it's the patients who said, this helped me. And I think what that gets us back down to every one of us is that if we've benefited, we are the most powerful messenger to people in our circles who maybe not be open to this as much as we are. So I'd encourage people to sort of come out of our bubbles and reach people that, uh, or even engage people who think differently or have fears um, and, and recognize that it'll take a lot of time. Sometimes you plant an idea and they reject it and then six months later they're more open to it as things develop. So I think we need to go into those pockets of um, fears and anxieties and I would say that the, the one that worries me the most in terms of marketing um, is fundamentalist Christians in America. You know, as if there's going to be a backlash from anywhere, that's where I would predict it would come. On the other hand, I think we've got it fairly well neutralized because a lot of those people are very um, pro-military. And so the support that we have from the veteran community, I think, has neutralized that. But that's my one big concern. We probably don't have too many fundamentalist Christians here at Burning Man. Uh, but, uh, you know, actually, we were doing therapy with someone who grew up... Um, in a fundamentalist community, and that kind of warped him in a bunch of different ways. So anyway, I think we need to market not just to those people that would already agree, but some of us have to be going into those areas where we would most uh, disagree. But I also want to echo what Graham said, um, and this was Barney Frank, who was a, a gay congressman, the first, o first openly gay congressman from Massachusetts, incredibly um, eloquent guy, and he, was, he said this at a... Uh, annual conference for the Marijuana Policy Project. He said it's easier um, to give your allies the courage of their convictions than it is to change somebody's mind who's already against it. So what that means is there is a lot of people who agree with us, uh, agree with the value of psychedelics, agree with drug policy reform, but aren't courageous enough yet to step out and do anything about it for any number of different reasons or aren't completely persuaded. So that's the, the I think, from the marketing, from a political perspective, is getting those people that have tended to be um, sitting on the sidelines and try to, but might agree to motivate them enough to get involved. And I think that's what we particularly need in the 2020 election. Yeah.